Hello and welcome to the third quarter final of Pro Tour Magic 2015. I'm Brian David Marshall. I'm joined by Pro Tour Hall of Famer Luis Scott Vargas. And we are watching Yuki Ichikawa versus Jackson Cunningham. Yuki Ichikawa only has four Pro Tours under his belt, Luis. Yeah, and he's top eight at half of them now. Which, <laughs> uh, again, we keep saying it, but it is just an incredible stat. There, there's a little, there was a little bit of like, ah, uh, <laughs> in your yeah. voice there. Uh, yeah, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say that I'm not, uh, you know, a little yeah. envious of the, yeah. you know, one for one that uh, Jackson Cunningham has, or the two for four that Ichikawa has. Yeah. So uh, we're underway here, cool. and uh, Ichikawa scries a uh, card to the bottom of his deck. Who, who do you like in this matchup? I think that both decks are pretty sweet. I do like Ichikawa here. I, I think that uh, the fact that he's got eight accelerants that Jackson cool. can't really interact with means that he's going to be able to play Planeswalkers early, and Planeswalkers do tend to match up well against ground creatures. Okay, well, there's our first ground creature of the match. We have an experiment one. The fact that uh, Ichikawa did not have either a Elvish Mystic or Sylvan Carrington is a big deal, though. It means that there's going to be no turn three Planeswalker. And, you know, look, looking at Cunningham's hand here, he's, you know, he's got stuff to do, you know, for, you know, the next five or six turns. Yeah, he's basically <coughs> one land short of Old an Lance optimal Lance. draw where he wants to draw three land in all Thank spells you. up to, a, you know, to the point where you have Advent to the Worm. But... The fact that he's not going to be able to cast these three drops unless he draws ah. land could, could be problematic. Go. So Golgari Charm takes out the experiment one with the evolved trigger on the stack from Voice of Resurgence. And Voice does force Ichikawa to play a spell, but I think Jackson actually wanted to attack first there. Well, I guess with an experiment one, you can't actually do that. But in general, you want to attack before playing cards that force your opponent to play spells. Experiment one obviously being an exception. And here is the dreaded Courser of Krufix. This is just a big brick wall that Cunningham's got to scramble over. Yeah, and this is another reason uh, that I think this matchup right? is in Ichikawa's yeah, uh, favor, is that uh, uh, Jackson is not able to kill Courser in a yes. very easy yeah, yeah. way. I mean, he can, he can kill it with Celestia Charm if Ichikawa blocks, but Courser just leads to a pretty good advantage when it just sits in play. The third land being pretty much exactly what Jackson was looking for there. Well, this is, this is a nice attack. Cunningham has no Celestial Charm in hand, but Ichikawa doesn't know that. Right. This, would be, this would be an awesome block by Ichikawa, even though I, obviously I don't know if it's right or not. You know, it depends on what he thinks uh, Cunningham has in his hand. Yeah, he just he decides, he decides to just take it there. Which I think is generally the correct play, but it is funny. That that was a good play by, by Cunningham. I mean, that attack there does you know get you two free points of damage if he doesn't block. Go ahead. All right, Loxit and Smiter joins the uh, Selesnya army. Of Krufix. Putting in work as usual. Yeah, just like, oh, look, here's a land for you. you Want to dig yourself closer to a spell? Come on, let's do it. That last attack was helped for Cunningham by the fact that voice is kind of a free roll attack. So <laughs> even, if, even if Ichikawa does block there, you still get a token. Right. Which does make Ichikawa more likely to block. Yeah, healthy. So it takes two from the stomping ground. But gets one life back. Oh. And it lets him play Xenagos. Xenagos does provide a steady stream of satyrs to block with, so Cunningham has to decide whether he wants to use a Johnny to fly over and kill Xenagos. What would be your, your inclination here? I think it's reasonable to do that, especially since you don't really have a, any tramplers here. If you have an advent token, that'd be very different. But given that you don't have an advent token, the smiter can just run itself into Xenagos every turn, but it doesn't really get you anywhere. And as soon as the smiter dies and Ichikawa starts accumulating tokens, that's even worse for you. Right. <clears throat> if you're going to jump, though, I think I like uh, Ajani, give the voice flying right. a double strike. and then you're able to keep the elephant back. And just keep the elephant back or, or attack with the elephant. Though, at that point, you get double block and just trade it for a Corsair, which doesn't seem great, especially with two Boon Saders in hand as combat tricks. Since uh, Cunningham did draw a fourth land, so if he draws a fifth land, then he's able to start bestowing the Boon Saders. Cunningham contemplating his options. His other option could be to play a Johnny and plus plus one the Smiter, so then it doesn't get killed by a double block. Sure, just make a 5-5. Five, five. He could also just attack with it, and because he's already represented Celestia Charm, and Celestia Charm really breaks up a double block here, so I, I doubt Ichikawa would double block. He might just block with the token, though at that point Celestia Charm also just trades for Xenagos because it gives Trample, so looks like Cunningham's just 
potentially going to attack with both, really you know, counting on this selling of the Celestia charm <laughs> that, he, that he put into motion last turn. The sell Esnia charm. Yeah. <laughs> The longer he thinks about it, does it uh, does the does the play lose effectiveness? Uh, not necessarily, because Celestia Charm does actually lead to some complicated outcomes here. So, I think it's very plausible that he'd still have it, even if he thinks for a while. It does kind of give away that he's got other options that are you know available pre-combat. So Ichiko has to be thinking of at least considering a Johnny here. So if if Cunningham attacks with both, and Ichiko assumes there's a Celestia Charm in in Cunningham's hand. I, I'm trying to think of what exactly the best blocks are. You could double block the Smiter, then you lose both your creatures to a charm. You could block Smiter with just the Seder, then you lose Xenoghost to a charm. Or if I nothing happens, you. you lose the Seder. <laughs> oh, but we're just coming to the face here. <laughs> this does make sense, though. Ajani represents eight points of damage right now. Right, and Ichikawa is at 13. And Ichikawa doesn't have a ton of spells in his deck that play at instant speed. He's got, he's got you know, more mortars than anything else. Mortis is a great card, but you don't have to worry about it if you're Cunningham when you're going for the lethal Johnny attack. Hero Celestia Charm is a lot less bad for you if you just chump the Smiter. So I think it's pretty reasonable just chump the Smiter with the 2-2 and then take two. Or in this case, offer it a trade and you get on a nine, which is still not lethal off of Johnny. Okay. The voice token is not incredibly impressive here. And at this point, I think Jackson will be looking to post-combat play a Temple Garden untapped, right. and then play Sunblade Elf, leaving the mana up to cast an end-of-turn Boon Seder. Damage. Oh, damage. Jackson did have to think for a little while to pretend like he still had the Celestia Charm, because it is very important that Ichikawa plays around it. Of course, the way these things usually go is he then draws it, and now Ichikawa is correct <laughs> to play around it. <laughs> and Ichikawa's like, I knew he had it's it. It's always brutal to sell the bluff, and then, and then obviously draw the card, and just, like, you actually don't want to put it in their head that you have the card. Actually, since Ichikawa has double ultimate price in his deck, he only has Putrefy and Abrupt Decay that can kill the uh, Loxanon Smiter at instant speed, which, which is a big deal. And with top eight deck list, that's the sort of thing that uh, Cunningham has to be aware of. And, 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 and he and Jeff were going over stuff right up until the last minute. Yeah. And like, and so they were playtesting at yeah, breakfast today. Yeah, getting, getting Jeff mic'd for that segment, like the producer had to go out to the playtest area and mic him at the table. They were, they were getting every last minute. There you go. There's the Temple Garden upright that you, you anticipated. And so Sunblade Elf. And no, no Johnny here, though. You, you just keep no, your Boon Seder I think, up. I think you're going to Boon Seder and... The problem with the Johnny is it opens you up to like a sorcery speed removal, like the, the double dread board that is in uh, Ichikawa's deck. It also opens you up to potentially killing, getting one of your creatures killed, and like a hasted Xenoghost token coming over. It looks like uh, Cunningham is running it. The one advantage to this, though, which I hadn't gotten to, was that if you pump the Smiter now, next turn uh, the Smiter's lethal with the Johnny. The problem is that puts that on the board, so Ichikawa knows he has to play around it. I slightly favor just having a Johnny in hand and trying to, you know, get the kill out of nowhere because what Cunningham could hope to draw was another one drop to make it so the voice resurgence token was in 5-5 five, five naturally, and then a Johnny does double damage. This gives you a more guaranteed kill if Ichikawa doesn't do anything, but Ichikawa's got some pretty good options here. He actually could go land, plus one Xenoghost, mortars you, and then that reduces it to just a smiter and then attack a Johnny down to to three, but that actually still leaves you dead. So that's, that's probably not what he wants to do. And getting, getting a look at each time's hand, that's, he, he is holding mortars. Got he's a lot holding of, mortars, got a lot of land. But he has a lot of land, and he, he's actually not able to, to break up this combo right now. The, the, putting the smiter out of mortars range actually ended up working out really well. I mean, it's a toss-up between the three mortars and then the two dread boars, but there were more mortars than dread boars in the deck, so this is actually going to turn out fairly well for Cunningham here. So Ichikawa can pressure a Johnny, but if Cunningham just goes for it, I actually don't see a way that Ichikawa can get out of that very easily. He can go to 10 this turn when he plays a land. He can go to 10. He can kill, either kill one of the blockers and attack and make a Xenoghost token. Like, he can kill the voice token, make a Xenoghost token, attack a Johnny with both. Cunningham just chumps with the Sunblade Elf. A Johnny goes to 3, then double strikes the, the Hierarch, or the Smiter, rather. And then uh, Ichikawa does die to that. Alternately, Ichikawa can you know, kick mortars, but then that just leaves it on the board. 
So Ichikawa is going to, I think, have to represent instant speed removal and hope Cunningham doesn't go for it. But given that Cunningham played the Ajani, I mean, that is his plan. <laughs> he just laid it out on the board. Like, it's kind of hard not to. RSVP'd. I think Ichikawa is also past playing around Celestia Charm. I think he's going he's gonna to have to just realize that he, he can't beat a Celestia Charm. So he, that, that, that whole bluff sequence was good by Cunningham, but ultimately Ichikawa doesn't really, you know, can't really respect it. He just has to ignore it. You're saying it's the perfect time to draw a Celestia <laughs> Yeah. So it, it actually doesn't look like that's necessarily needed here. Vizium Mortars on Sunblade Elf. And I think this is going to be followed up by a Xenagos. Double attack a Johnny and hope that the, the voice token does not block there. Though, again, if Cunningham sticks with his Ajani plan, he's, he's, I think he's you know, pretty likely to just trade for the Xenagos token and then put a Johnny to three, then minus three a Johnny. So, I mean, it's risky, but... I think that's what he has to do to win this game. Certainly what it looks, looks like what is happening. Yeah, I think he's more deciding which to block rather than whether to block, though. This does really leave you in a bad spot if Ichikawa's instant speed removal, but I think we've just already gotten past that point. Right. Go. Johnny falls to three. Go. Token trades with the token. And Ichigo has three cards in hand, one of which Cunningham does know because of the Courser. He knows the, about the Temple of Abandon. But the other two cards, I mean, if they're the Putrefy or Abrupt Decay, that, that's it. But those are the only cards in Ichigo's deck that save him. Uh -oh. And people Sorry. are asking why he didn't attack with Mutavolt. Well, he just played the Mutavolt that turn. So unlike the Eidolon of Great Revel we saw <laughs> earlier, Mutavolt is not a haste. <laughs> All right, you're in. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That, that was a well-played game by Cunningham, though. Yeah. Good table presence, made some good decisions, represented things, had, had some anticipation of how his opponent would react to what he was doing. Yeah, and I, I think, as you can see, the, the two points from the voice attacking through the courser were really, really important. So the Celestia Charm bluff actually won him the game. Interesting. I'm curious how these players are going to sideboard. I know we have a, uh, I did an interview with uh, Yuki Ichikawa about what his plan was. So uh, let's go to that and see what he, what he's going to be doing to his deck after game one. Okay. Tell me your sideboard plan after game one in this matchup. Sure. Eh, sideboarding. えっと、ネコからいこうか。ネコからじゃあ、え、セレズニアは早いデッキなので、え、プレインズオーカーを、え、2歳外すべて抜きます。そうですね。いや、is a で、え、あと、え、エルビッシュミスティックを2枚サイドアウトします。これは、え、サイドインするカードが、ま、ほとんど除去呪文なので、え、マイターン除去呪文を打った方が有効的なので、え、マナクリーチャーは、え、あまり
I think he's playing like lots of blockers. He has lots. Of, he has a some O3 walls, some 2-4 car, uh, caryatids and coursers. So a lot of my low drops aren't as good. Like there's a soldier of the pantheon. I can't get through. I can't even charm it to get bigger. So taking out uh, three of those and replacing it with three unflinching courage. Um, reasoning is it's it's not great, but it's better than the soldiers, and it'll help me push through. Um, and he doesn't have tons of instant speed removal, and it gets around mortars if I get guys big. Um, and then I'm also bringing in two of Johnny's presence just for Mizium mortars and his random spot removal, and taking out um, two Sunblade elves, which again are just like random two twos that can't really get through. Um, pretty simple, not hugely optimal, but I think it's the best plan. What are you expecting to see from him after sideboard? Um, I'm pretty sure he brings in the magma sprays for Voice of Resurgence and just some of my little guys, which I'm taking out. And then he has Doom Blades, which are good. Um, and he probably takes out Thought Seizes and um, potentially some a, a few Planeswalkers okay. um, and brings in Golgari Charms, potentially. Okay, good luck the rest okay. of the match. Thanks a lot. Okay, there you have it. Uh, so he seems to have a, a fairly reasonable sense of what Ichikawa is going to do. And, and what do you think about his plan? Well, uh, Jackson certainly isn't prepared for this matchup. Not that he should have been. This isn't right. you know a hugely played deck, but his sideboard plan is definitely like, yeah, take out my five worst cards, add in two really good cards in Johnny's presence, add three pretty medium cards in, <laughs> in Unflinching Courage. And he even said that. I mean, he, he's well aware right, that right. these aren't great. What they are good at is, like you said, getting past mortars and trampling over blockers. So... You know, if Ichikawa, let's say, plays a Zanagos, makes a token, then you go, unflinch, encourage my smiter, attack. Eh, that actually does negate that to some degree. Sure, sure. And uh, how do you like the Ajani's presence? I think that card's excellent. I think that's his, his best card post-board, uh, you know, that he's bringing in. Just because it's for one mana, it not only kills a removal spell, you know, it trades for it. It also gives plus and plus one. So if you're attacking, you're getting a little bonus there. And if you can strive it, you can, you know, stop an overloaded mortars. And you're just trading for a more expensive spell at a time that's probably inopportune for your opponent. I mean, I, I, I imagine that that's a card during the Swiss that had tremendous value. It's probably not a card you're thinking about. Yeah, it's not, it's not a very commonly played card, but uh, I think it's very effective in, the, in this matchup. Th does it lose a little value uh, in, in a top eight, or is it still oh, not that much you can do? I mean, the fact that it costs one means that there's not a whole lot Ichikawa can do, but it does mean that he's not going to run into a strived one, you know, like, I'm going to tap out to overload mortars and there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, he's not going to do that. Whereas, you know, I, I would be surprised if Jackson didn't get someone during the Swiss with like, a, you know, supreme verdict you. It's like, all right, cast, you know, <laughs> a Johnny's <laughs> presence, kill you. Whereas they, they would not have done that if they knew he had those in his deck. Right. P pretty jealous if that actually happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, countering a planner cleansing would be even better. Uh, so what, what do you think about Ichikawa's deck now without Planeswalkers, right? You know, it's just, well, then it's just Jund. Yeah, it, I... I think it's reasonable still. I mean, I think I still think I like Ichikawa's side of the matchup, though down a game, he's definitely not favored to win the match. That's yeah. just <laughs> not just, how probability works. Just simple works. math. <laughs> uh, but it is a little, like, he is a little off the plan he his deck is built to do. He has less cards that take advantage of it than, like, when Jun Monsters boards in a bunch of removal, it still has, like, Storm Breath and Pelucranos to, like, end the game. Right. Ichikawa's a little lighter on win conditions, so I think... He can definitely have a game where he kills Jackson's first three or four creatures, but then doesn't actually apply enough pressure to end the game, whereas that's less true in a more threat-dense deck. Okay. So, uh, I mean, do you, do you see uh, Ichikawa being able to push this to three, or, or do you think, you know, has, has the tide turned a little? Uh, I mean, I think he's pretty likely to. I mean, he's got, he's got a good shot. Like, his removal spells are cheaper than Cunningham's creatures, and his Planeswalkers do provide an incremental advantage. Planeswalkers backed by cheap removal is an effective strategy, so... I think that Ichikawa's got a pretty decent shot. I mean, a as we saw, Johnny versus sorcery speed removal is pretty good. <laughs> and a Johnny's presence plus a Johnny is actually a nice combo. It right. protects you, the guy that you're double oh, striking yeah. for. Yeah. But but Doomblade Doom Blade obviously would have made a huge difference there. Yeah, I mean, having Doomblade instead of mortars there, though Ichikawa's not taking out mortars. Right. But more having access to just more two-man removal spells, especially more instants, is a really big deal. So he's just, he's just a kill-everything deck right now. And find have the last threat standing and finish the game off yeah i mean his 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 optimal plan is to get an advantage through having you know course of crew fix in play having his anagos in play and just having the game progress for multiple turns whereas cunningham's just trying to end the game right i mean i like the fact that cunningham has a lot of instant speed creatures advent of the worm does a pretty good job of you know pressuring planeswalkers and 
It's also Inichi, uh, in Cunningham's favor that he took out some of the one drops that died of that magma spray that we just saw. Right. It's obviously very good against Voice of Resurgence, but if you look at Jackson's hand right now, uh, I mean, besides the the Celestia charm, there's no good targets for magma spray. Magma spray does not match yeah. up well against Fleece Main Line and no. Advent of the Worm. No. Fle Fleece Main Line making a case for itself to be a uh, real player in the coming year between the last Pro Tour and this Pro Tour. Oh yeah, definitely. We see, we you know, we saw eight in this top eight, and we saw you know four in the final in the winning deck <laughs> of the last Pro Tour. All right, here we go. We're ready for game two of the quarterfinal match between Jackson Cunningham and Yuki Ichikawa. Straight up. Yeah. Right, and once again, we start scrying. Wow, we like that one, though. We're keeping that Yeah, it top. looked like a Temple of Abandon, which is an insta top, since uh, I think Ichikawa kept, you know, a kind of landlight hand with a scry land, which is generally a good thing to do. It's one of the powers of scry yeah. lands. Yeah. Get a look at... Uh, Scavenging ooze. Good. Scavenging ooze is a card I really like bringing in here. Uh, Ichikawa has access to. It's it's a card that Good. when you're when you've killed a bunch of your opponent's creatures does actually end the game. This is the threat he's looking for. It actually right. gains a bunch of life, becomes a five five or a six six. So I, I think that is one of the cards that it, he's actually gonna have get a pretty good value out of post board. Doesn't come with magma spray though. No, <laughs> and now and now he's got to deal with a fleece main lion. Yeah, and each guy's got some good options here. I mean, he can play a Karyatid, which he would have liked to be able to play last turn, but he just drew it this turn. Uh, and he didn't have <laughs> untapped green even, so. Right. But he can also just kill it right away. I like playing Karyatid if, you know, a couple turns later, he would have wanted to kill it before it becomes monstrous, but no real danger of that right now. And I think Mortars is the card that rewards you the most for saving it because it turns into a Plague Wind later. First Fleece Main Lion, pretty much the best two in this matchup, just because Voice does die to Magma Spray and does not attack past Carry Tid right. without the aid of Celestia Charm. Yeah, and it, w it wasn't entirely clear. Ja Jackson no sounded like he might be thinking about even taking some of the voices out at some point. Huh. Yeah, I, I don't think he wants to do that, even if they don't interact well with some of the cards that UK has against removal decks. They're just, they're just good enough. It also makes it so you can play Voice before, you know, trying to do an Ajani attack which forces Ichikawa to either respond or give you a, a voice token, either of which you're you know, fairly happy with. Wow. I mean, uh, ja Jackson's just curving out here, though. You know, best three drop, best two drop, best three drop. He's yep. going to be able to make a 5-5-4 five, five, drop at instant speed. Yeah, this is an optimal hand. Ichikawa is going to have to, I think, use the mortars before he wants to here. I don't think he can just, you know, take a giant hit. Well, plus, there's a Selesnia Charm and a Boon Seder to make things even more complicated. Uh, as... Uh, Jackson has untapped mana. Yeah, Ichikawa is heavily incentivized to play his spells at, on, at sorcery speed in this matchup, just because once Jackson has mana untapped, yeah, between Celestial Charm, Boon Seder, and then Ajani's presence, he's got a lot of ways to foil Ichikawa's removal spells, and it's, you don't really don't want to get hit by any of those, because that, that's going to end up usually leading to a loss. If you if you try to kill something and then it gets Ajani's presence when it's hitting you for five, that's just, you know. You, you, you know how Rich was getting shivers every time uh, even Flock played an Elixir of Immortality? <laughs> that, that's how I feel anytime someone casts into Johnny's presence. Yeah. And, and even the, you know, people bring up that a voice doesn't interact all that well with Corsair and Karyatid. The fact is the other removal cards in, the, in Jackson's sideboard just aren't, aren't good. I mean, it's better than a Skylasher <laughs> or, or a Satessan Tactics. Those aren't the kind of cards you want in this matchup. So certainly it's not the card you would love to have, but it is better than the other options. Here comes the scavenging ooze. And Ichiko deciding whether he wants to play an untapped land to grow the ooze right. after casting a mortars or not. He could potentially, it looks like, yeah, it looks like mortars plus ooze is the combo here. Could potentially be trying to set up some kind of magma spray hand, but using double magma spray is not really what you want to be doing. He could double magma spray the line or something like that. Ichiko could also offer the trade here of ooze for fleece main, but that, you know, after eating the smiter, but that leads you into a bad place via Celestia Charm. Another reason that Ichiko also didn't play the abrupt K in his hand is that it, it kills uh, Advent of the Worm tokens very, very well. <laughs> Dead. Whereas Mizzy Mortars does not, even though Mizzy Mortars does do a good job overloaded, and he could have overloaded it next turn. Yeah, with I was just saying, next turn he was going to be able to, 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 to kick it. But didn't really want to put himself in a position of, of taking a lot of damage here. 
and uh, being maybe one jump in the air away from, from, from losing. Yeah, it, Ichigo is really hoping to draw another removal spell to kind of like bridge the gap between mortars being kicked and mortars not being kicked. But he didn't, he didn't hit that. He hit double magma spray instead. And uh, as I said before, Cunningham's hand was not conducive to getting destroyed by magma spray. So Ichigo was pretty much forced into playing the way he did, I think. I don't, I don't think he could just take a giant hit there. I mean, the double magma spray is probably going to be pretty sweet for him if Cunningham decides to sink five mana into that uh, fleece main line. At yeah, that could, that could work out. I kind of like atta an attack by Cunningham there. He, he doesn't actually want Ichikawa to trade there, but maybe Ichikawa won't. I mean, this does completely represent Advent, which Ichikawa is prepared for. And I, I would estimate that Ichikawa wants to, to abrupt decay it right away to not get destroyed by Johnny's presence. Yep, there comes the, here comes the advent, end of the turn. How many cast? Four. Okay. So the upside of not killing it now is that Jackson might make an attack based on having the worm, or might even do something like just a Johnnying it. But the downside is a Johnny's presence, you just lose the game. So I I think it's a little risky unless Ichikawa has a reason to believe that uh, Cunningham does not have a Johnny's presence in hand, since he is aware that Cunningham's boarding it in. There's no way that that isn't happening. So you want, you want to take a look and see, uh, we have some notes about how these guys actually did sideboard, see if they were uh, playing, holding true to what they said in the interviews. Looks like it. Uh, Ichikawa did, the Planeswalkers he cut were the two Chandras and the four Zanagos. So that left room for basically putting in all the removal, plus a thought season in the sideboard, uh, oh, double nine, plus yeah. the double ooze, which makes sense. Here, here we go. So yeah, before, <laughs> before, before Jackson gets a chance to untap, he's yeah. like, I'm going to abrupt decay your token, Zero, sure. and I'm going to double okay. magma spray your fleece main lion. Yeah, I like that. I mean, that, that just makes it so Celestia Charm and Ajani's presence no longer save anything. The board is cleared, and it forces Cunningham to have more threats and potentially more ways to protect them. And if Cunningham drew, you know, maybe two ways to protect them, that could strand them in his hand. That, so, that's Ichikawa's empty hand. Yeah, he is, he is hellbent. <laughs> cool. So experiment one, followed by voice of resurgence and a pair of two twos on the board for Jackson Cunningham. And Ichikawa, again, really looking for a way to get a recurring advantage here because he doesn't have much in the way of actual card advantage without his Planeswalkers. So this is the, this is the risk is that he you know he traded three removal spells for three threats but at the end of the day you know Cunningham has like a lot of threats in his deck and Ichikawa yeah. just drawing removal is not necessarily going to finish things off. Advent also making scavenging use a little less effective. The Loxon Smiter gets uh, exiled from the graveyard and scavenging use becomes a three three. Ichikawa goes up to sixteen. Now we're in Boon Seder land. And while both decks actually have the same land count, Ichikawa has a bunch of scry lands, the temples, which mean that as the game goes on, he will get some advantage out of doing that. He, he's going to flood less, a lot less in the late game. But he still needs to draw like a Nissa. A Nissa would be perfect here. He doesn't take that Planeswalker out, huh? No, and uh, it's interesting because Xenagos is, I think, the slightly more powerful card just because it's cheaper and, you know, gives haste and all that. But Nissa does, you know, interact with Jackson's creatures much, much better in this matchup. Ba basically, all you do is just make a 4-4 four, four every turn. Yeah, I mean, Ichiko doesn't have a ton of force to untap. <laughs> and eventually, ultimate, I mean, the ultimate, you know, is actually good, so, especially in a matchup without sweepers. So... Yeah, you see Jackson thinking. Nope, now he's, he's, in, he's in pretty good shape here. I mean, he's got a Boon Seder he can bestow. He's got a Celestia Charm. Like, he's going to be able to make an attack. He's going to be able to play a trick. And it's not going to work out all that well for Ijikawa unless he has a removal spell in hand. And that's what, of course, you know, Jackson has to think about. Right. He has to decide which removal really gets me here and how do I play around it. He, he was also counting, seeing if there were any creatures in Ichikawa's yard. Yeah, he wanted to make sure that Scavenging Ooze wasn't going to do anything that he w wasn't expecting. Mm. Of course, the problem with that is a removal spell could put a creature in Jackson's yard. Yeah, and it, especially if it's, say, another Abrupt Decay, where Ichikawa goes for it, or Jackson goes for it, and Ichikawa Abrupt Decays the Boon Seder itself, and then eats it with Scavenging is. Though Ichikawa actually only has the one Abrupt Decay, so I guess, <laughs> I guess, I guess that, that answers that. 
And that's the sort of thing that only happens in the top eight. In the Swiss, you're never going to know if they have one, two, right, three abrupt right. decays. But in the top eight, you can yeah. actually, you know, two. remember these things. And it actually rewards you for remembering which of his cards are one ofs, which are two ofs, etc. Do you uh, do you stress that in playtesting? Do you, like, go, this is, like, there's only one of this. If you see it, you know that, that you're clear of that? Or is that just something that you internalize and just kind of know through a million tournament reps? It, it's kind of tough because when you're playtesting before the tournament, you don't want to know what's exactly in your opponent's deck because that's just not a tournament condition. Right. When you're playtesting for the top eight, you should be reminding your opponent of that. You know, your playtesting opponent, so they kind of get in the, the, the hang of things. Okay, no Sylvan Carried it gets in the way of Voice of Resurgence here on the attack. No blocks on Experiment 1. And this is a good block. If the Karyatid dies, then the ooze gets bigger. You're not really risking much. You don't need the Karyatid. This kind of forces Jackson to do something because even though he's this is a profitable attack either way, he has to do more damage than this, so... Yeah, I like just going for the throat here. The carry tit again, doesn't do a whole lot, and this way there's nothing to feed the ooze, and you're taking, you know, six damage right now, which sets up a Johnny being a great jaw. Yeah, I've, I've been shocked by how good... I heard you were, you were not a big uh, Johnny Caller of the Pride fan in playtesting. No, it, you know, Ifro and I were on the Pat's Naya deck until, <laughs> until the day before the tournament, actually, and but where Pat played three of Johnny and one Boros Charm, we were probably going to play, like, two and two. Okay. I mean, we still like the card, it just... We, we like Boros Charm because it was cheaper. Though so, uh, Johnny did so much work for Pat that yeah, yeah, I'm surprised he didn't share his deck list with us. He, he, <laughs> if he had only told us Naya was he has, great, he's a bad teammate. Yeah, <laughs> that or he said you know Naya was great every day for the past six months. One of the two. Yeah. There, there's a second scavenging ooze. Yeah, scavenging ooze is not a card that's actually great in multiples. Yeah, so they, they, they compete for food, and only one can you know grow giant. And so Cunningham has to be thinking here, if Ichigo had the ooze, he would have played it last turn. So he just drew the ooze. And if he had a removal spell, he probably would have also played it last turn. Unless it was a sorcery speed well, in which case he would have just cast it just now. So it's pretty likely that Ichigo does not have a great card in hand. Uh, which he just drew an advent of the worm. Well, that makes things even easier. Because b before then, you know, if you drew like an Ajani, you'd have to think about whether you want to go for it. Advent's actually perfect because it lets you just attack and then just leave mana up to at some point cast it without, you know, fear of really anything going wrong. It also even evolves Experiment 1 right now. Because the toughness on the Experiment 1 is only 4. Yep, it's still, you know, it's yeah. the last thing that can evolve Experiment 1, <laughs> you know, given that it's, you know, a crawl worm, but it mm. still does the trick. The final evolution. So ja Jackson's only attack have, like, is with... <laughs> They're asking him to speed up now. <laughs> A classic cutting him. <laughs> yeah. We have more time, right? I like thinking. By the way, just a reminder, you know, there's all, in addition to the video coverage we're doing, you can go back and sort of go through this play-by-play -play in the text coverage that's being produced for each of these matches. So, you know, there, there'll be a sort of permanent document of, of what happened. Or you can just rewatch this video. Yeah. Live coverage is great. <laughs> Cunningham, again, very worried about removal because Ichiko, you know, he's playing a lot of one and two of There's so many different cards he could have in hand. I still think that this attack is pretty safe. Uh, there you go. He, he attacks with the... Wait, one second. <laughs> <laughs> the voice attack may be a little less safe just because he doesn't have a way to pump it and it just feeds the scavenging ooze with the voice of resurgence token not, not being, you know, great. But I think unless, you know, Cunningham comes to the conclusion that he should not be attacking with Experiment 1, there's really no way for this turn to go badly for him. Even, yeah. You know, whether he attacks with voice or not, he's still going to end up in good shape. I do like not attacking uh, with voice for whatever yeah. it's worth. Six, four, yeah. So a double block here could potentially try and kill the experiment one, but we could see something pretty pretty sweet, which is, you know, mid-combat regeneration by evolving it with the advent, then removing two tokens to regenerate it, <laughs> and then still having it be a 5-3, which is enough to kill the scavenge, both scavenging uses. So Ichikawa kind of just steering clear of that train wreck and just <laughs> offering up carry tit as a sacrifice. So just the carry at it gets in the gets in the way. Good. He's like, okay, it dies. 
great. Yeah, I do. And even if, you know, with a Celestian Charm, there's no real reason to just use it to just deal five right there. I think sure. it's going to come in handy later. Ichiko thinking, where do you want to put the Scavenging Ooze counter? You, th the longer you wait, the more options you have, but, you know, you are giving up a green mana. Right, and you also just want to use your, use your mana efficiently, right? Yeah, though, Ichiko did end up tapping such that he could not represent black removal once his scavenging, or once his carry to died, which, yeah, you know, kind of doesn't sell the bluff as well as it could have. Yeah, it's, a, it's amazing to me how uh, much information is conveyed in even the, the tapping of mana. You know, even even like what you're just representing. You know, we watch we watch the player. You know, by leaving you know Ben Stark by leaving blue and one open in in, in a limited mat round. You know, just completely get his opponent to play around a card that wasn't in his deck for several turns. Yeah, and, and it, you know, thinking about it and tapping your mana is is a way to you know kind of tell your opponent what's in your hand, represent something you don't have, or if you know conceal things you do have if you purposely tap so you can't cast them. Oh, interesting. Like, if you're very sure you don't want to cast, say, an Abrupt Decay, and you just tap it so you can't cast it, and you have to be very sure, because this does cost you something, but if you do that, your opponent's going to be like, well, he doesn't have Abrupt Decay, or otherwise he would have left up, you know, two Overgrown Tombs, instead he just tapped them. So right. that is uh, something that you can use if you're pretty sure of th how the turn's going to go. Chikawa. What, what, what is he holding? Did he did he draw something uh, relevant this turn? Looks like he did. <laughs> and he also played the Lanar Waste, which you know looks like looks like he's. Uh, okay. Can I get the English text on that card? Yeah, yes. Sure. Yeah. You have it? So he's playing a uh, Putrefy. No pain lands. No damage lands. No damage. Um, like no. Are any of those? Do you take damage? It's like, no. what lands did you tap? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what what Cunningham wants to know actually though is whether Putrefy can allow regeneration, which it does not, because otherwise he could play Advent to evolve and then regenerate Experiment One. As it turns out, the Experiment One is going to head to the graveyard. Yeah, zero cards. Zero cards. Black Witcher. Right. I think at this point, Cunningham is just letting his, his, his experiment hit the bin. And each cow, of course, doing the sorcery speed in order to not right. trigger voice resurgence. Which is which is a big deal. Let's Boon Seder attack without, you know, without getting stuck onto an experiment one. All right. It's the advent of the worm. <laughs> Cunningham keeps reaching oh. for the die. Yeah. His opponent keeps handing him a worm token. So the oozes are potentially redistributing that plus plus one counter from experiment one pretty much anywhere. Got a mutavault vault back to block with. So Ichigo does have, you know, creatures you can block with, but Celestia Charm on Advent of the Worm does present, you know, a pretty big threat. Right. There's ac there's actually two creatures he can eat here, right? There's still there's still the carry added in his yard, then there's the And Ichigo chooses not to eat the carry to the end of turn because he doesn't know where the counter wants to go. <laughs> if it was just one ooze, I think you would eat it. Another thing he has to consider, too, is if a ooze becomes a 5-5, five five, it gets Celestia Charmed. So I think he's going to want to, a lot of the times, end up with, like, two 4-4s four for as right. long as he can. And uh, Ichiko did want to tap that Lanner Oasis, I think. I mean, maybe he's just planning on activating a Mutavault and is pretty sure of it, but leaving a painful green instead of painless green is a little better with Scavenging Ooze. Oh, yeah. Jackson Cunningham sends everything into the red. Yeah, there's so yeah. many permutations of blocks here with, you know, a ooze that's potentially a 4-4, four, four, a ooze that's potentially a 3-3, three, three, you know, Mutavaults plus an ooze that can even grow bigger up if you don't activate Mutavault eating the second creature that I think it's pretty tough to figure out exactly how Ichikawa is going to block, but by attacking with three creatures that are pretty tough and that you don't mind losing, you know, Jackson just basically putting the ball in Ichikawa's court and making him make a decision and commit to something which lets you use Celestia Charm a lot better. I'd be surprised if Ichikawa could really afford to play too much around Celestia Charm here. I mean, the best way to play around Celestia Charm might be doing something like blocking the worm with like both oozes and then activating them twice, making like a 4-4 and a 3-3. So you lose one ooze naturally, and then both if you have Celestia Charm, but then the worm dies. 
but then he goes down to four and has a Mutavolt against the two token or the, the voice and the Boon Seder. I guess you gain a two off the oozes, but you lose one back to Lenor Waste, so it is tough. It's it's no matter what comes out of this, Ichikawa is not gonna be in a good situation. I don't think he dies this turn unless he basically doesn't block <laughs> nine power worth of creature and gets Tusken Charmed, but that seems fairly unlikely. But regardless, he's gonna have to draw basically probably two or good three good spells in a row while Cunningham draws nothing. So and that's assuming he, assuming he doesn't make blocks so he just gets destroyed right. by Celestia Charm, which might not even be wrong. I mean, he might just do the math here and realize well, he can't beat a Celestia Charm, so just assume it doesn't exist. It looks Look. like he's thinking about the Mutavault here. You know, pulling that land of our waist yeah. back. So that's that, that looks like, yep. That is going to animate a Mutavault. It looks like he's thinking about putting it in front of a... Uh, Boon Seder? Mutable on Boon Seder is, is, I think, one of the better blocks just because you're not really getting out of, you know, dying if you attack the Boon or if you block the Boon Seder with any of your creatures. You might as well throw Mutavolt as the least value. So you could do something like Boon Seder gets blocked by Mutavolt and then Voice gets blocked by an Ooze and then you just take five. Celestia Charm doesn't, it kills your Ooze, but you don't take a million damage. <laughs> I like the slow, like. Yeah. You know, exaggerated horror movie creeping forward of the creatures into the red zone to block. So here you do get a successful trade. So now it's actually up to Cunningham. He can either uh, yeah. Celestia Charm. Actually, if he Celestia Charms the voice, the, the ooze becomes a 5-5. Five five. So I think you just let the voice die and then maybe just let the Boon Seder die. You could also Celestia Charm the Boon Seder, which basically trades Celestia Charm, since the ooze is dying either way, for two right. plus one plus one counters out of the graveyard. And a little bit of extra damage. Right, you get you get a point of land or waste damage in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that, I mean, that is value. I don't think that you want to Celestia Charm the voice. Charming the voice, you end up with the ooze that's still just bigger than it, so right. you actually don't really, you know, get anything out of that. Charming the Boon Seder is also not great. These are good blocks. I think that just getting in a fight with the Worm Token is just too risky. And this way, Ichikawa guarantees that at least some number of creatures are heading to the graveyard. Right. Which can then make the ooze bigger. So what I think Jackson wants to do is save the Celestia Charm and uh, end up using it to exile an ooze once it hits 5-5. Five because five. Ichikawa is going to eventually want to make a 5-5 five five ooze, most likely. I mean, he might be playing around Celestia Charm and try to keep them both at 4-4, four four, but one's dying to the Boon Seder. That's priority. So, given that priority's passed by Cunningham, which I like... Ichikawa was going to, I think, just let things stand. You, you end up trading Ooze for Boon Seder. You end up eating the voice. You get a voice of Resurgence token. You take five. But then end of turn, you can start growing the Ooze. And what I think, you know, is unavoidable is this Ooze becoming a 5-5. Five five, right. Which means Celestia Charm is going to exile it. Which means Ichikawa does need to draw an answer to that worm right away. So we go to a 4-4 four, four, ooze. So Ichikawa has two draw steps now, potentially. I mean, he's got a Mutavolt to chump with, and he's getting a little bit of life off the scavenging ooze. Didn't use the Lanar Waste to grow at end of turn, which maybe because he didn't want to take a point, maybe because he's playing on <laughs> Celestia Charm. It is tough. He does have a nice little burst of life gain in him here, though, right? Like, he, there's, there's enough creatures in the graveyard that he can, even if it's getting charmed, he can, he can say, okay, well... I'm going to gain four here. Yeah, there's like four more creatures in the graveyard, so that gives each go a little bit of breathing room, but I think the Celestia Charm is still going to be really good uh, here. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's going to be, uh, to quote someone who's come through the booth a couple times this weekend, <laughs> devastating. Yeah, I knew that was coming. <laughs> <laughs> there you get a look at Celestia Charm. All of its glory. Target creature gets plus two, plus two, and trample. Exile target scavenging ooze with power five or greater or put a 2-2 white knight creature token with Vigilance onto the battlefield, the least used mode. Yeah, though it, it is also the fact that it can be a, you know, a, even if it's just like a kind of medium two drop, just a, having a two drop when you don't have a two drop is really important. I think Celestia Charm is, you know, one of the best cards basically for any of these decks. The uh, Pat Cox played four is one of the best cards in that deck. And so I think I think it just, all the modes do things that really matter, like killing Obzidite or Desecration <laughs> Demon or Polucranos that... You know, plus two, plus two, and trample on, like, a giant boon satered creature. All the things added together are really, really good. 
And the fact that the worm token has trample already means this turn's going to go really, really well for uh, Cunningham. Ichikawa could make a really heads up play here. He's got an option to animate Mutavolt, double block, and then just offer the trade of ooze for a worm. The problem is that doesn't leave him with an advantage here. I think he's going to have to just go for blocking the worm, making the ooze <laughs> giant, and then losing it to Celestia Charms. It inches like it oozes over to the worm there. <laughs> so even though I think Ichikawa is, you know, dreading the Celestia Charm and well aware of it, I agree with his decision to just walk into it. Like, if you just trade for the worm token, I don't think you're really getting an advantage. You're not. You're going to end up losing the game. And I think here you're, you're just in much better shape if it, this does hard. work. Of course, if it doesn't work, well, we're about to see what happens when it yeah. doesn't work. <laughs> it involves, you know, Ichikawa going yeah. down to a very low life total, depending on how many creatures he removes as the worm just tramples over the exiled. Yes. So Ichi Ichikawa is just offering the trade, but... Yeah, so, so now he has to just use... Oh, that that was awesome. Wow! Go, go, guard charm. I didn't see that in his hand. That was wow. an awesome draw. Go guard charm. All creatures get minus one, minus one. His scavenging ooze becomes a four. Yeah. So now the now the ooze doesn't die to charm. Charm resolves. He regrows the ooze. It kills the worm. Then it kills the the advent token or the restoration or resurgence token because it has minus one, minus one, and now there's no worm token in play. <laughs> <laughs> Not only was that masterful, it actually works out perfectly for Ichikawa. He might just run away with the game now. <laughs> In an unforeseen turn of events. Turns out Golgari Charm was just the best possible draw. Yeah. Save. Game yes. up. Yep. Gain one. Go to five. Yeah. Yeah, Can I, says pass. Is that English? Can I see the, the card? <laughs> Cunningham getting to read the card. It's going to be his unmaking this game, I, I expect. I mean, the game isn't over, but now Ichikawa is going to have a giant scavenging ooze ready to just roll on over, and Cunningham doesn't have a, actually very many turns to kill it. It's going to just get out of control. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yep, there goes the advent token. There goes the resurgence token. And here comes the scavenging ooze. No reason to hold back now. No, and, and it... Sink all your mana into it. And if Cunningham had another like Advent or any instant speed creature, I think he would have played it after the Golgari Charm to keep the voice Golgari. token alive. 20. Right. So I think you can just assume he's got nothing. I mean, there aren't any cards he could have in his hand that are relevant that he would not have played. So you, you just go, you know, go for it at this point. I, I love magic. Yeah. That, that, that was <laughs> I awesome. don't think I've ever seen that interaction before. Uh, yep, I have not either. Mm -hmm. uh, we now have a three turn clock. No, maybe uh, uh, it's just a two-turn <laughs> two turn clock. clock. <laughs> yeah. Forgot about the so, so now Cunningham actually just has to peel here. He's just dead. And even if he does, I think he's in the kind of the abyss lock. He has to draw like Voice of Resurgence to block for two turns. He could just draw a Celestia Charm to kill the ooze, you know, successfully this time. But he does not have a lot of time to draw it. On a card. How many cards? No cards. <laughs> <laughs> Ichikawa, once again, hell bent. Go. Okay, that's a pass from Jackson Cunningham. It looks like he drew a mana confluence, so it looks like the game's actually over here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 oh my god! Wow! That was unbelievable. Uh, Just yeah, that, a perfect was, top deck. Great understanding of how his cards interacted with each, with each other. And then good execution. And then great, yeah, it was perfect. Like including the making ooze a 5 5 and then passing. <laughs> so that they would offer the trade, which of course, you know, Jackson's not going to so go I for say, at that point. Okay. So. Wow, and, and, and each guy would drew the card. Uh, <laughs> yeah, kind of like, if I'd passed, would you have just made the trade? <laughs> yeah. 
And I think Ijikawa may have made the trade if he just passed. I mean, he was very clearly thinking about Celestia Charm the entire time that game, including not pumping loses earlier, all that sort of stuff. Wow. Yeah, let's take a look at uh, Golgari Charm. I think we have a... Uh, a yeah. <laughs> just so not a card... I think... Was, was this a card on your mind as you were coming into the event? Well, I mean, we had it in a bunch of different decks because it's just very powerful. Basically, all the charms, as long as, like, two of their modes are good and one is decent, they, they still are going to see some play. Just because they're so flexible and they only cost two mana. And as we saw here, Golgari Charm used in a way that it's not normally used, but still very, very good. Yeah, I, we're going to really see... Uh, I think Yuki Ichikawa's got to get used to the idea that he's probably going to be asked to sign Golgari Charms at events for the foreseeable future. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I could definitely see that, yeah. So, uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, well-positioned against blue-white control decks featuring Supreme Verdict and Detention Sphere. That's, that's you know, I, again, we talked about that idea of the uh, Ajani's Presence yeah. In uh, in in uh, Jackson Cunningham's deck. Yeah, and, and Golgari Charm, especially out of like Jun Monsters, for example, that that's you know where it really shines. They try to contend your Planeswalkers with. Uh, <laughs> they try to contend your Planeswalkers with Detention Sphere, and you just kill it. They try to kill your whole team with Supreme Verdict, and you just regenerate. But also, you know, does double duty against aggro, killing a bunch of one ones. So th the fact that all the modes are useful in different right. matchups means it generally is a card you want in your deck against most of the field. Good against goblins, good against monsters. Yeah, when you, when you have a card that's good against goblins and blue white, I mean that's a good card. You do side it out sometimes because sometimes the modes just are a little lackluster. But in general, go, you know it's the kind of the perfect kind of main deck card. Okay, one one of the other big cards that was uh, loomed over that entire match and and which may, ended up making Golgari Charm so good was Selesnya Charm. So let's yeah. talk, let's talk a little bit about that card. There there you see it. Uh, you you know you talked about it during the match that it just. All three things that it does, it does very well and uh, does very well in the decks that really want it to be in there. Yeah, and, and for the aggressive decks like Naya or Green White, the, the exiling five power creature I think is the best mode because it's a two mana removal spell against cards that would otherwise, <clears throat> you know, present you with a problem like Desecration Demon. But the fact that it's also a two drop, you know, you're, you're weak as two drop if you're casting it as a two drop, but it, you have the option. And then it's a pump spell when they make, you know, a block like we saw that where, you know, plus two, plus two and trample is good. The, the fact that it's a removal spell, a creature, and a pump spell, like all in one card, again, that's just very efficient, very flexible, and that's kind of what the charms do. Right, and get, getting Obsidat. Yeah, is, getting is, Obsidat's a nice one. <laughs> I mean, that, that's really nice. There, there are not a lot of instant speed ways to, to get an Obsidat. Yeah, I mean... Especially it, in a green-white deck. It even gets, like, you know, Advent of the Worm out of the mirror. Like, it, it does a lot of what you want, you know, to do. And an aggressive deck can't usually afford to just play a straight-up removal spell, right? Like, th these decks don't have Banishing Light or Busy Mortars in their main deck very often. But because Celestia Charm is also a creature, you can just get to kind of, like, free-roll the creature on top of a removal spell. Right. Uh, so w if you were ranking the whole cycle of charms in terms of their impact on Constructed, where, you know, where, where does Celestia Charm uh, sit for you? I think the, the top three contenders right now are Azorius Charm, Celestia Charm, and Golgari Charm. And I think Azorius and Celestia are the top two. So I would say actually right now Celestia Charm might be better than Azorius Charm. I mean, Supreme Verdict decks are, you know, Ivan Flocks, the the, the, <laughs> the last remaining member, uh, you know, left in the tournament. They're still good decks, but I think Celestia Charm might have a slight edge. There are more Celestia Charms than Azorius Charms, you know, than any Charm actually in the top eight right now. I'm surprised to not hear Boros Charm listed in, uh, put on the short list. I, I think Boros Charm is good, and we actually see eight Boros Charms in the top eight as well. But Boros Charm is a little more focused; it's a little less versatile. The, the, whereas, like Matt Sperling's deck, you know, is just using it to do four to the face. You know, Pat Cox's deck was just basically using it to do double strike, sometimes indestructible. So, I think that Azorius Charm and Celestia Charm are just so much more flexible, even though all the cards are very powerful. Okay, okay. Well, we are ready for a. Game three here between uh, Yuki Ichikawa and Jackson Cunningham. So let's go back to the table and watch these guys determine who will advance to the semifinals here today. Experiment one is uh, on the play for Jackson Cunningham. Which is a pretty optimal start. I mean, experiment one is your, is your best one drop. Yeah. And especially after board when you've sided most of them out, still having a one drop is really good. Uh, the always pious Yuki Chikawa goes to the temple again yeah, yeah. for the third straight game on turn one. And this is a great hand for Cunningham. Just <laughs> curving experiment one into double fleece main line or voice fleece main line is very, very good. 
What, what do you go with turn two? I like the line. You just you, you just want to attack. Okay. And because if you had, let's say, one voice, one line, I think it would be a lot harder because you want to grow experiment one from a 2-2 two, two to a 3-3. Three, three. Right. But since you have, well, now three fleece main lines, you just play line on turn two, play line on turn three. Especially since you don't have Bio Blight to worry about. We saw Pat get completely oh. annihilated by Owen's Bio Blight in the, in the quarters, and, you know, that's not going to happen here. That, that, was, uh, that was actually sickening. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that... Okay, here comes a thought sees. It's not going to like what he sees. But he's going to have to see something. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we've actually found in our testing that Thoughtseize are surprisingly good against the aggro decks. The aggro decks are trying to combine cards a little more than they used to. You don't want it against, like, red aggro because all their cards are the same, you know, right. and a pretty low power level. I mean, I know I was playing the red deck in this tournament. But uh, against, like, the Naya deck and the green-white deck, they actually have a pretty decent variation of power level between their cards. And they're trying to combine cards, like combine a Johnny with, you know, Smiter or something like that. And being able to break up combos is pretty nice. Yeah. In this case, Thoughtseize does generally fight well against Experiment 1, but Cunningham just drew a very redundant hand here, so that is not the case. Uh, the, having Elvish Mystic here is pretty important, though. We're, we're, we're looking at a uh, turn 4 Nyssa right now. Dreadbore, yeah, Dreadbore something, turn 4 Nyssa, make a 4-4 four, four creature. Which is decent, but this is a pretty good start on the play for, for Cunningham. That Experiment 1, uh, probably, probably not going to a 4-4 four, four here. <laughs> I, I assume that'll... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Or, or not. Um, well. Oh, yeah. That, that's actually uh, uh, right. Sorry. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Easy mistake to make. So Dreadboar can't uh, kill Experiment 1 here because it has now two counters, but just eating a Fleece Man line is pretty good. And Experiment 1 doesn't, isn't going to grow to a 4-4 all that often in the deck. I mean, it clearly can, but it's not, it's not the sort of thing that happens on turn 4 all the time. Ichiko might be getting close to chump block mode here. Even if he kills one of the Lions here, he's taking six going down to two. I mean, that's pretty tough. Having the Elvish Mystic not come out till turn two and having Cunningham basically play a 3-3 three, three on turn one, two, and three makes right. makes this game very, very difficult to right. win. And his, his Nissa creature... Nissa uh, doesn't untap the land, right, so he exactly. needs to have. Yeah, yeah. He needs the, both Elvish Mystics to survive in order to to play an untapped, to make Nissa, you know, make a four for off an untapped creature. But if you Dreadboard go to two and then make Nissa, you actually just die. So he's going to need Chico's going to need a different sequence of plays to survive this game. And if you chump yep. and you stay at five, then next turn, you still aren't able to to Nissa and stay alive. And I think that was an advent, which an advent should just about seal the deal here. Just because each guy's going to have trouble beating the board already. Right. And that advent is just going to make it so, you know, Jackson just basically can't lose here unless something very strange happens. W would you consider an advent to drop him to one? It's not necessarily not great here because it, all the creatures are still lethal. I think exposing advent to, like, Dreadbore is not really what you want to do. And okay. each gets to plan around it. Of course, it's not actually coming up here since Ichiko is choosing to correctly block Experiment 1 instead of Fleece Main Lion, but it, is, it would be something to consider if it was not blocked. Okay. That's right. yeah. even, right. the, even though uh, two top eights out of four Pro Tours is amazing, Ichiko may have to wait a little longer to, before hosting the title at the end. But Ichiko is not dead here because he can ultimate price the advent token. But he is definitely in trouble. He's actually, this is a kind of awkward spot too for Corsair since if he wants to be able to make a land drop off top of his library, he still wants to leave black untapped in order to, to cast ultimate price. So he has to decide whether he wants to tap Mystic or just play his forest first and, and then just play Corsair off that, which definitely represents that he's got abrupt decay or ultimate price. One thing that may you know, make his decision a little easier is that the one life going from five to six doesn't actually change the clock here. Though it could change it next turn if you block and go down to three and then go up to four. four so right. You stay out ahead of one creature. One, one disadvantage of a three-color deck, though, is that let's say Ichikawa does play Corsair before playing a land drop. There aren't that many untapped, painless lands that he right. can play off the top of his deck. We, we may just well see him play that forest out of his hand no matter what, right? Yeah. yeah. 
the, I mean, this is the slightly riskier play, but when you're behind, you should make riskier plays. This also telegraphs less because you're not making it as obvious that you have a two mana spell. Right. Not that Cunningham's really going to do anything but play the worm token here. So Ichikawa, if Cunningham plays no other spells this game, or for at least like the next two or three turns, Ichikawa can ultimate price the worm, block the fleece main, but that requires Cunningham to also not have a, a fifth land. So it's kind of hard to put him on no spells, no lands. <laughs> And none of the green-white lands come to play tapped, so this is this is a tough spot. Corsair is likely going to have to chump this turn, and that, that that's going to make this a hard game to win, because Experiment 1 is going to evolve off the Worm Token. Right. So he says go. Yeah, I think that's, that's correct. Ichikawa can't play around anything anymore. He can't play around a Johnny's Presence. He can't play around Celestia Charm. He just has to hope nothing happens at any point in the game. The land there is pretty relevant. I mean, it makes the lion into something that cannot be blocked by Corsair. So now Corsair has to just get thrown away. Ichikawa's drawing a Sylvan Karyatid. He's going to have just a Nissan hand with five mana. He's basically going to be in Abyss mode very, very quickly here, at which point uh, it's going to be hard to come back. Yeah, everyone comes in. I mean, Ichikawa has even got the, like, you know, uncomfortable situation of blocking the line and forcing at least Cunningham to tap out, which means nothing new is coming into play, but you're still facing down <laughs> two lethal 4-4s, four one of which is Indestructible and, and Hexproof. Yeah, yeah, it's just not good. Ichikawa was in a pretty tight spot last game, and he maneuvered very well to get out of it, but this game is going to be a little tougher. He doesn't have an ooze in play generating an advantage. He's got less... That's you know kind of going to bring him back in the game if something happens. Right, and we know what we know his top card is yeah. not very impactful. Corsair is kind of a spoiler there. Yeah, <laughs> it does it does show you your future. Jackson, of course, can just pass here. He doesn't have to monstrous the lion because he's got lethal you know coming in. And as soon as Ichikawa commits, yeah, as soon as Ichikawa ultimate prices, you you'd gladly pay five mana to kill a Corsair proof. Yes. Yeah. I would pay to kill a course of crew fix that wasn't even in the game I was playing. <laughs> yeah. There's the ultimate price. There's the monstrous. Um, take a hold. Four. Two. But Ichigawa's next turn, I guess, is play Sylvan Carrioted, chump chump. Go. Followed by <laughs> draw a card and extend the hand. Is, is my uh, prediction for how these next turn, two turns are going to play out. <laughs> There's a possibility Ichikawa skips the intervening phase. <laughs> right. <laughs> and just, you know, goes straight for the handshake. But, uh, you know, no reason to do that. Might as well play out. Jackson playing a voice first, just in case. You know, make it more sure you don't have any tricks. The Pro Tour winning creatures yeah. go into the red zone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, damage. And, uh, yeah. Jackson just piles on. There we go. Jackson Cunningham advances to the semifinals in his first Pro Tour. That's He's undefeated in top eight matches. <laughs> <laughs> yes. There you see Jeff Cunningham, his older brother, come over to uh, slap him on the back, literally. But, uh, I mean, Ichikawa is someone we're going to just be talking about for a while. I mean, you know, two Pro Tour top eights and four tries. Yeah, I mean, uh, two Pro Tours from now when he has a third Pro Tour top eight <laughs> and six. <laughs> I mean, that's how it works, right? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Uh, just uh, su super impressive to watch. I mean, I that play in game two is going to be one of my highlights from this event. Yeah, that, that I, was a very I, good I go play. back to, you know, you know, it was great, too. He even hid the card from us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he did an excellent job. He just drew it, played it there. Uh, it was just wonderful. Uh, so we got one more quarterfinal match to bring you. We're getting set up for that. In the meantime, we're going to throw it back to the news desk, and they'll tell you all about it. We will indeed. Thanks very much to Brian David Marshall and Louis Scott Vargas, BDMLSV. Great stuff. One more quarterfinal to come. I'm here with Zach Hill. Uh, Zach, uh, we hype the big moments in Pro Tour coverage, uh, but quite genuinely, 
It was a really, really cool play in that uh, quarterfinal there featuring Golgari Charm. Yeah, I mean, basically, you know, Ichikawa pumps his scavenging ears to 5-5 to trade with a worm. Cunningham, really excited, gets to turn on his Celestia Charm, deal 5 damage. Golgari Charm, not the most oftenly used mode of shrinking your own creatures yeah. to counter spell removal. And then, of course, Ooze growing again to take out the worm. I mean, really just unbelievable play to get uh, you yeah. know, force a third game, but uh, Cunningham taking it in the end. Yeah, now at the start of this match, it looked like uh, people voting uh, in the poll that you can check out along the Twitter, uh, the feed along our uh, bottom of the screen. A lot of people were voting for Ichikawa, felt that John Planeswalkers was pretty heavily favored, but really, even despite that sort of heroic play with a uh, Golgari charm, kind of felt like Cunningham was in control for most of that match. Yeah, I mean, being on the play in the third game, normally in a mid-range fight, the kind of mid range deck has the advantage, but that green-white deck can get some blistering fast starts, and that's what we saw. I mean, Ichikawa had plays like every turn of the game. They just weren't enough. All right, so Jackson Cunningham through to the semifinal, but we don't know who he plays. That's what we find out next. Our fourth and final quarterfinal is William Jensen against Pierre Christophe Monden. So it's all US in this final one. It's black white mid range against John Planewalkers. Why don't we find out a little bit more about William Jensen? We'll show you what his career is. He is on the Pantheon. Definitely the most successful team in the last 12 to 18 months. He's 32, close to $150,000. That will go past that number uh, as a result of today. Closing in, indeed, next time we update it, he will be over 300 lifetime pro points. This is his fifth Pro Tour Top 8, the champion of teams at Pro Tour Boston more than a decade ago. He has three Grand Prix titles, eight Grand Prix Top 8s this season. He has much to smile about, and he is cannot wait to get his quarterfinal started. Let's see how he made it into the top eight. And there you see, he was the dominant story of day one. Andrus, Sam Tharmarat, and Daniel Hansen fell in draft. Then Jensen unleashed his black-white mid-range deck. Sundstrom, Cunningham, Dominguez, Muller, and Shinin. And don't forget, Jackson Cunningham awaits the rematch in the semi-final if William Jensen can get there. Back we come on day two. Jesse, Turtenwild, Sperling, go down in draft. Then we have Friedman, the loss, Su Ching Kuo win, and then it gets a little bit nervous, even though he only needs to just shake hands with someone. Pat Cox says, I can't, beats him. Ichikawa says in Japanese, I can't, beats him. And then Ivan Flock in the last says, yes, let's have the handshake. Let's both potentially meet again. They're on opposite sides of the bracket. That could yet be your final. So what about his deck then? It's black, white, mid-range. Let's take a look. Zach, what are we looking at here? I mean, we're seeing a deck that most of Team CFB Pantheon ended up playing. It's a black, white, mid-range deck, but what it really, it's, its roots are in the mono black mid-range control deck that's been dominating so much of the standard season. See a lot of the cards that define that archetype here, Thought Seize, Pack Rat, Hero's Downfall, Underworld Connections, Desecration Demon. Uh, what you gain from white are big threats like Blood Baron of Viscopa, Obsidot, Ghost Council, and of course the card that really defined a lot of the last pro tour, Elspeth, Sun's Champion. Yeah, she's a fabulous, fabulous lady and a fabulous, fabulous card too. All right, now uh, we have a teammate and friend of William Jensen waiting to talk to Marshall Sutcliffe. So without further ado, let's send you over to Marshall. He's with the fabulous Matt Costa. Hey guys, I've got Matt Costa with me here. Now, Matt, you tested with, uh, with Huey yep. leading up to the event. Give us a, a picture of sort of the bigger picture of what the testing looks like for the PT. I know you guys come in a bit early. Yeah, so about 11 or 12 days before the PT on a Monday, there's nine or 10 of us that show up at the airport and go to a, a huge house that we've rented. Um, and basically from then on, we play Magic 24 seven. The rest of the team, most of them arrive about a week later you know, the people who have job have commitments jobs. and, mm -hmm. you know, can't spend all the time there. But basically we wake up in the morning, eight or 9 a.m. We play magic, we eat, we play magic, we play magic, we eat, we go to bed. Is that day. really how, like, is that the goal or is that, you know what I mean? Like, does that actually happen or is there like video games and pizza and, you know, what, what, what does anything get in the way? Or are you guys pretty regimented? We, we play a lot of magic. You do? Yeah. Wow. Okay, so now let's focus in a little bit more on Huey specifically. So he's on the list that, did all of you guys play 
uh, of this black-white deck? Most of us played it. Uh, okay. Andrew Cuneo and Yelger Vigersma played blue-white control, um, and a couple people played a slightly different black-white deck, but for the most part, we all we all played the same deck. Okay, so you guys all know this deck inside and out, then, yeah. as far as Constructed goes. What would you say uh, Huey's confidence level is uh, going in to his quarterfinal match here? Uh, I mean, I'd say he's extremely confident. Um, you know, he's one of the all-time greats, whether... You know, he might be a little bit modest about that, but we all know it. Um, and we think we have a great deck. And, uh, you know, the John matchup is something that we prepared for before the tournament and prepared for last night. What's his demeanor for testing, Huey? Is he, uh, is he very rigid, you know, sort of straightforward tester? Or does he like to mix it up and have some fun experiment with stuff? Like, what, what's his general vibe when you guys are uh, working through your, your, your work cycle? Um, I mean, experimenting is really important. Um, you know, if you play a lot of games doing the same thing, you don't really learn that much. And, you know, we didn't have a ton of time. We had a few hours last night and a few hours this morning. So he tried some different things, decided what he thought the best way to approach it was, and that's what he's going with right about now. So once he makes the top eight, talk to us about what happens from the team's perspective from you, the rest of the people that support him. I mean, is it a situation where he runs home and goes to bed? Does he start shuffling up and start trying out sideboard options? How does that work? Um, you know, you got to balance the two. Uh, there's no substitute for a good night's sleep before the tournament and being in a good mental state. But last night, you know, we had a quick dinner, and uh, myself and Reed and Owen and Huey played their respective quarterfinals matchups for maybe an hour, hour and a half, and then we let them get to bed. Well, he's certainly lucky to have such good teammates, and uh, we'll see if that luck pays off. Let's head back over to the news desk where Rich Hagen awaits. Thanks very much, Marshall. One black-white mid-range deck is already through to the semi-finals. That's Owen Turtenwald. Now William Jensen tries to make it two. One Jund Planeswalkers deck is already out of the semi-finals. That's Yuki Ichikawa. Now Pierre Monden tries to take his Jund Planeswalkers into the semi-finals. Black-white, Jund Planeswalkers, Jensen Monden, the fourth quarter-final right now. <laughs> 